Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, workshop tutorial about how to reproduce and scale deep learning, machine learning on uh, Kubernetes with Polyaxon. Um, to give you a quick overview about what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, I'll be giving an introduction about myself and the project, how it started. And then I'm going to talk about how, uh, what is it that uh, Polyaxon enables in terms of what I'm trying to solve with this uh, platform. Uh, I call it the experimentation workflow. And then I'm going to talk about like, the, um, the users um, that we try to target with the, this platform, um, direct users, indirect users. And then we are going to dive into uh, some kind of like demo tutorial. Um, you can follow the tutorial, but I'm most probably sure you cannot do it because you, you need um, to have first uh, a cluster. You can do that on a mini cube, but mostly you need also like, to um, download like, images for, uh, for uh, Docker, but also like installed packages, and uh, the internet will not allow to do that. Um, during the, the, the demo, you, you, uh, you are welcome to ask questions uh, if you don't understand something or you want to have like, some clarification about like, um, uh, how things are working. And at the end, uh, I'm going to give like, uh, an overview, overview about the, the roadmap of the project for the, the near term, and you can also like, ask questions about like, the uh, generic question about the platform. So my name is Murad. Um, the, I'm the author of Polyaxon. Um, yeah, you can find me on uh, GitHub and uh, Twitter. This is my handles. And I have a background in uh, software engineering and uh, applied mathematics. Um, after the engineering school, I started working uh, in finance and banking. Um, then I decided to switch to tech companies where I was. Uh, so basically, in uh, finance, I was doing mostly like. Um, software engineering, but also like uh, quantitative, quantitative modeling, uh, mostly working with the uh, Gaussian copulas and um, uh, Monte Carlo uh, simulations. And um, when I switched to tech companies, I was doing software engineering, but also uh, data science, data analytics. And um, Polyaxon started as basically some wrappers around the first version of uh, TensorFlow when it was basically just providing very low APIs. Uh, it was very hard to, to do anything, especially when they, they were upgrading every, uh, every time. It was really hard to uh, get any model to work again. So at that time, also, like, uh, Keras was not um, targeting TensorFlow um, specifically. It was also, mostly it was used with the Theano. And yeah, uh, last year in September, I just decided like to add more stuff around Polyaxon by providing like some uh, spawners for uh, uh, for Kubernetes, um, trying to have also like um, tracking for metrics, um, reproducing like experiments, and doing a lot of things. And yeah, uh, I'm still working on it right now. So. Uh, what does Polyaxon do? So the, 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 the main objectives of this platform is basically to enable the, the users to um, iterate faster on their algorithms. So basically simplifying how we can access to um, uh, powerful machines and do um, experimentation with the different kind of like uh, frameworks and libraries. Um, one of also the main ideas is like it can be deployed anywhere. You can use it in your um, in your uh, computer. By uh, so basically, it leverages, leverages Kubernetes to uh, have this kind of like portability of the, the platform. So we can install it on uh, Minikube or any kind of cloud uh, platform. Or if you have also like an on-premise uh, on um, cluster. It also tries to solve uh, issues related to reproducibility, and we will talk about that when we're going to start talking about like, the experimentation workflow. Um, it's open source, so basically it's targeting everyone who wants to uh, rely on uh, open source uh, um, uh, solutions. I think uh, in the recent years, especially for data science, a um, lot of um, uh, companies start using like, open source as the main uh, way to um, um, Build uh, machine learning models and also like deploy them. Um, also, one of the ideas is that it should work with any kind of like library, uh, <coughs> since it leverages also like the container technology. Uh, whatever you want to use, it should be like uh, useful. Wh whatever you can um, also like run on a um, on a Linux machine, it should be also like run with the Polyaxon. So basically, you just provide uh, how it works is just basically creates Docker images and run your code inside these Docker images. Um, most of the data scientists also don't know how to use Docker, and they don't need to know how to use Docker. So the, the platform uh, simplifies this basically by just 
saying, for example, what kind of like libraries you want, you want to use for this experiment, and everything is done behind the scene uh, with the platform to create a Docker image. Start it somewhere. Uh, if you want to you have access to GPU, it gives you like GPU. If you need like more CPUs, it gives you CPUs, and um, yeah, and uh, the platform should be used by single users who want some kind of like. Um, organization for their uh, data science and machine learning. Uh, obviously, if you are just running one experiment and you're, you're not caring about what's the results, you don't need to use this platform. But if you want to have um, some kind of organization for future and you want to know what uh, experiment has, uh, which results, what outputs, artifacts, uh, you might think about having something or, uh, organized. It also like targets uh, large teams. Um, by that is basically trying to um, uh, help teams to have some kind of like collaboration and basically have some kind of like um, role management where you can, for example, view some experiments, contribute to some experiments, or not access to any of these. So. What is the experimentation workflow and how I understand, or at least like how uh, what I'm trying to 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 solve with this uh, platform? So when you start like doing some kind of like machine learning that you are targeting some kind of like production um, um, models, you will start with some kind of notebook. Uh, I think you already did that today with other uh, workshops. You start doing some kind of like exploration, doing some kind of like experiments uh, in uh, yeah, in the notebook, and then this, the code starts growing, and you start like hitting the same kind of like uh, problems that software engineers uh, have. So you think about like some kind of version control system like Git to track uh, all the the changes of your code. Uh, the problem is that you don't know when you start an experiment. You don't know if you are using the right Git commit or not. So basically, sometimes you just change um, some kind of values, and then you run the experiment, and then two two hours later, you don't know if you if you committed before or after, and that becomes really hard. That's why also like um, we try to manage pretty much all these kind of like uh, phases of the the the, the projects. Um, one of the things also you do is like uh, your code is not only responsible for the core machine learning algorithm. So today. You, sh you saw a lot of things around how to use tensors and how to build like some kind of architecture, but most of the, the code will go like into data cleaning, uh, data management, um, uh, enhancement of the data, like augmentation, and many other like aspects. And this becomes easily like a, a big uh, project because a lot of people will start contributing, and then you don't know how the whole workflow is uh, is going. So. Once you have like a, an experiment running, you will get like some results, and most probably you will not be satisfied with the results. So what, what you do is like basically you tweak the parameters, you run again. Maybe you need like GPUs to go faster, and after a couple of um, experiments, you you want to basically create a huge space of parameters and just tra uh, do some traversal of this space with some kind of like other algorithms like uh, Bayesian optimizations or other like uh, tools, and. Once you start doing that, you will have like a huge um, uh, problem because uh, you don't know uh, what um, experiment generated what kind of like um, artifacts, logs, where how, how to access them. Should should you just uh, SSH to the machines? Um, how to link between these kind of things? And if, even if you are satisfied with one of them, the, the the results, you might might want to like deploy this uh, uh, somewhere and. You need to tell the either you will send this by email or like you just package it, you put it in a zip somewhere, so upload it. But anyways, it's like a huge problem because like the developer needs to know what kind of. I mean, if also like you are having this problem with staleness of the models, which means that like every week, for example, you need to train a new model, uh, new data because like data is coming or like do, do an online, and you have also like this kind of like pipeline for like deploying this new model every time. And sometimes you also just want to share like the results with your the rest of your team, compare results. Um, and basically, someone is leaving the team, and you you want to reproduce everything that he did before leaving, and you don't know how. I mean, I mean, you will real rely uh, rely most probably on the do documentation that you wrote. Uh, you need to install this and this, and probably you will hit like some kind of edge case because you forgot to mention one of the the, um, the dependencies, and then you cannot. Basically, you have a huge technical depth. You have um, uh, no kind of like knowledge distribution uh, among your your team members, and uh, this is what uh, the the platform is trying to solve. And in terms of like the users that the platform is also targeting most most probably is like the the data scientists and the machine learning engineers so obviously like you have also if you are doing a lot of data pipeline and you have like data analysts 
But in, in order to use this kind of like platform, you need a Kubernetes cluster running, and that's required some kind of like DevOps. Uh, most um, most probably, like uh, as a software engineer, uh, as, a, as a data scientist, you will not know how to set up uh, a cluster, and you don't need to, because uh, what you want to do is basically just iterate as fast as possible on your algorithms. Um, so basically, the, the platform is providing a lot of uh, ways to tweak uh, uh, to tweak it in terms of like because it's already in, uh, has inside it like a database. It has a Redis for everything that is fast. It has a RabbitMQ for like talking with all the services inside. Um, it has also like a Docker. Uh, internal Docker because all the the images you don't want to publish them in the public uh, in public registries, but you want them just inside for either for compliance reasons or just for having like fast access to like this kind of like images. Um, so basically, this is where the DevOps uh, come to play. They are not directly using the platform, but they are providing the platform for other like users. And once you have like some kind of uh, experiments already um, uh, um, that you um, have good results with, then you want to deploy them. Well, most probably you will talk with some software engineers to take these models and put them in production. And it should be also like as easy as possible to have this kind of like access. Who can access in terms of like engineers? Anyone who has access to the cluster, to the machine, or should it, should it be like something, some abstraction where you are only providing this kind of like value to some uh, people that you trust? Um, so to. Uh, uh, to give a concrete like um, workflow of how all these things come together, um, I'm gonna start with something simple. Um, I'm I'm going to um, first of all I'm, we are going to talk about like how to install the the platform. Uh, what is it uh, like to install the uh, Polyaxon? So the first thing is like we have. Um, in, uh, in order to deploy uh, Polyaxon, uh, you need to have uh, a cluster, a uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, if you have a Kubernetes cluster, most probably you have also the Helm uh, package manager because it's the office, official uh, pa packaging manager for uh, Kubernetes. And it's, f from there, it's very easy. You just um, uh, basically target Helm to um, our our shards uh, uh, basically re repository, and then you just install the, the, the platform. Installing the platform requires a lot of tweaks. I mean, there's already sensible kind of like defaults to install it on your Minikube or even for a cluster. But if you want, for example, replication, you want to have more uh, kind of like control over how the database is like working, how the, how, uh, the, the internal um, RabbitMQ is working, you most, most probably want to have a look at how uh, all the parameters that the, the platform is providing if you need GPUs, uh, how many like replicas you want for the API, how many replicas you want for the worker, are you doing a lot of uh, uh, um, hyperparameter tuning? There's a lot of questions that you need to ask if you want to do persistence, uh, if you want to provide uh, high availability for uh, all these kind of like components. Um, once you have like the cluster running, you need also like to install um, the. Um, the, the command line interface, uh, which is basically just pip install uh, polyaxon CLI. Um, I have it already installed, so nothing. Uh, so once you install it, you have a couple of like command that you can interact with the the, the, the API. Can you make it larger? Ah, yeah, sure. Enough. More. <laughs> All right. So yeah, you have a couple of like commands to interact with the with the platform, and the the first thing. Uh, okay, I need to do it also for the other one. So w once you install um, um, a, uh, Polyaxon on your Kubernetes cluster, you will get like some kind of like um, an instruction how to link the um, the um, the command line interface or the API, the REST API, with the the the, the rest of the platform. So basically, uh, depending on your configuration, you might ha have uh, an ingress or load balancer or node port. So there's like di different ways how you can install it. In this case, I have uh, uh, I have it with an ingress. So it provides some kind of like steps that I need to f uh, to follow. I need to get like the IP where this uh, uh, where the platform is installed, um, the port for HTTP and the port for uh, WebSocket, and I need just to set up all these kind of things. Uh, so that's uh, basically there's a configuration uh, created somewhere. Uh, you can also like have uh, um, more control where you want to um, serialize this uh, configuration. And once you, you get that, basically you can you can log uh, you can log into the platform. Um, 
regarding the user, uh, so when, 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 when you deploy the, the platform in the Helm charts, um, you, can have access, uh, you can have control over um, how the user, uh, the, the root user, that the, the first user that the platform has, uh, like in terms of like email, name, and password. If you don't provide any password, the, the, the platform will just generate random password, um, and then you can get access to this random password afterwards if you are the, the, the cluster um, admin. So once you have um, Kubernetes, uh, Polyxon uh, installed on Kubernetes, you can log into the platform. So login is basically, there's different ways of, of login. You can just say, for example, root. So you're logged in. You can uh, basically start doing some kind of, um, uh, so the first thing is like creating a project. Uh, in this case, I already have a project created. In fact, I have already a project with a couple of experiments because I thought that I would not have access to the internet and I was like already trying to do some stuff, but in the end I, need, I needed like internet to do anything. So I have already like a couple of projects uh, installed. You can also like see them in the dashboard. So I have a couple of projects that I already like created. Uh, I ran some experiments there. Take some time because the internet is not it's not that good. Ah, okay, so it's not the wrong user. And yeah, I have a couple of, so a project in Polyaxon is more or less the same as in GitHub. You have some kind of like problem that you want to solve, you create a project, and then you start to have, you have like some kind of code that you want to execute, and you have to execute in different ways. That's the, what we call experiments. So uh, the thing is like everything is constructed around like primitives in Polyaxon. There's like multiple pr primitives, like there's the build, a job, we'll see all these kind of things. Uh, experiments, experiment groups, operations, and pipelines. That's something that uh, is not already, it's not yet in the, in the platform, but this is the kind of like primitive that the, the platform provides. Once you have um, a project um, created and uh, initialized, you can basically start. So I have some kind of like code here. I have uh, distributed run, um, uh, some, uh, some Python code for running, like for example, you can check this one. I think it's uh, with the PyTorch. Yeah, I have some code that I want to execute. It could be executed with GPU or with CPU, and it has like some parameters that I can pass. I can pass to, and basically to start this um, this code, I just need to run. Um, yeah, actually, I should have done this. So basically, I needed to upload some code before start running. I already uploaded the code because, again, same problem with the internet. Um, so basically, once you upload the code, um, Polyaxon creates a git commit inside. So it has also like another, it, it tracks also uh, all, your, uh, all your code internally, so that doesn't give you any chance of like making errors. I mean, you can rely, of course, on uh, GitHub or whatever, but if you are uploading the code and you're not using an external repo and providing the, the hash that you want to, to uh, run the, um, uh, the experiment with, it will just create a, a Git commit to know exactly that it used that, that version of the, the code. And you can always, when you restart a, an experiment, it will restart with the exact, exact same um, code. Um, once you create an experiment, what Polyaxon does basically starts um, a build. Uh, sorry. Um, so basically, this is a couple of builds that, okay, this is a large uh, project. Let's go to something simpler. So say we'll just reproduce the same thing. So we are going to run um, some code here. Oh, the wrong project again. So this is again uh, the same thing. We just created an experiment. And once you create an experiment, the project, uh, as, as, as I said, the, there is a build that is getting created. If there is, so basically it's running, I can also like get to that build. 
and get the, the logs. I can get the pass if there's already like some logs that I did not see and follow to get anything getting streamed. Uh, okay. Oh, I know what's the problem. <laughs> Stupid. Yeah, so basically um, the build uh, that we had is already created and most probably the, the experiment is going to be um, starting. So if we check the project again, experiments, we'll see that our experiment is running. can also like get the experiments. Uh, you can do a lot of things with the, um, uh, getting the experiment ID. You can get the help, for example, and see all the, the things that you can do with these experiments. Um, you can track the statuses, like at which, uh, uh, at what phase the experiment is uh, right now. So basically, it went through created, building, scheduled. Uh, so building is basi basically creating the, the Docker build. Schedule is like put somewhere in the Kubernetes cluster, and starting is basically just a phase in uh, Kubernetes where it validated that everything is fine, and then we should start the experiments. And running is basically running your experiment. Uh, once the experiment is running, um, Polyaxon rem uh, finished. Polyaxon removed this experiment from the, the Kubernetes uh, cluster to free the, the, the resources. So for example, if you have very limited GPU, um, you don't need to, uh, so basically once the experiment is finished, like uh, Polyxon sends some signals to basically kill everything related to that experiment to free the, those GPUs and keeps everything related to that experiment somewhere. For example, we can always get to the logs of that experiment. So. So if there's like some logs created, it will just show us all the logs of, for that experiment. You can al also like get the same kind of things with the with the dashboard. So that was um, the polygon tutorial. So if there's like some logs, you will see the logs. If there's like some kind of metrics reported, you will see the metrics. Uh, in this case, we don't have too many, too much. Uh, I did, I only, it, w it was a very short experiment. Um, it will tell you like the, the build that it used for uh, creating that experiment and many other like kind of like metadata that uh, you, can, you can see. Um, once you have this uh, very first uh, version, you might probably be satisfied with the results or not. But most probably not. Um, there's also like one thing is like when you start this experiment, I, it's crea uh, it does a lot of things. It downloads the data, goes through the, the data that does some kind of like operations and run the experiment. What, what, what you want to do in general is like um, you want to split this two, two things, uh, running the experiments and doing anything that is related to data management. So that's why um, in Polyaxon we have uh, different um, um, another type of uh, uh, primitives, uh, it's called uh, jobs. Uh, so for example, uh, a job could be just like download the data and put it somewhere uh, on, on your volumes that you provided. Um, here, for example, I have this download data file and I want to run it uh, with the polyagon file. So. Um, so I, I, I started an experiment, but I did not talk how uh, Polyxon knows how to, to start the experiment and like package the Docker and all these things. So um, Polyxon comes with the specification file. Uh, this is how, for example, you tell the, um, what kind of like um, a, a primitive you want to run. Is it like a job? Is it a build? Is it like an experiment? Is it a pipeline? Uh, you tell it also like how to create that that job uh, in terms of like. Uh, what kind of like uh, build image you want to create, if you want to install some kind of like libraries, if you want to install, for example, Keras, it would be just like adding a line here where you say pip install Keras. If you need to install some other things, basically just provide a, a very easy way to do run inside the Docker image. Uh, and then what you want to run. So in, in this case, I just want to run download data. So if I do um, polyaxon run and I uh, if, I, if I want to specify which file I want to use, I, I use minus uh, F, and I do the job, then basically it will start this, this job. Um, if we go to this project, we'll see that yeah, there's a job created. Uh, it's building currently, uh, so basically it's creating a build also. Okay, so most probably it's uh, now running. And 
once it runs, you can start like the experiments afterwards, knowing that already the data is somewhere. Um, the, the, the way um, you manage also like to, uh, the way to organize also like this kind of like data and also like not accessing the same data. So as for example, imagine you have a job and you're accessing the data and you, you basically change the, that data. The next data science is like relying that, uh, that the data is the same, but you already preprocess it. So um, PolyExon provides some kind of like paths. Um, so you have data where you should only access in uh, read mode. Of course, if you are the cluster admin, you can give yourself any kind of like access. But in general, it should be like you access to the data in uh, only read mode, and your jobs will have a path uh, that uh, Polyaxon creates uh, that follows some kind of like um, uh, some kind of like structure. Basically, the project uh, the, that it, belong, uh, it belongs to, what kind of like user, and it will give it some this path in like the outputs. And whenever you want to run an experiment, you just say, "I want to have the, the outputs of that that object, uh, that, that job, or that experiment for for that matter." Because you can have also like jobs that act on uh, the outputs of an experiment. For example, sending them, um, uh, doing some kind of checks. For example, later on before like deploying or doing whatever. So um, we started an experiment. We said like, maybe, maybe we are like satisfied or not. We might want to start a, the, the same experiment with different kind of like um, declarations. So here is a bit more complex. And so the, I will show you first the, the first experiment that I run. The first experiment is, was also like very simple. I just need to, act, to have access to uh, TensorFlow, and I want to run my model. Um, the second experiment, maybe I'm not super um, uh, satisfied with the results. I want to have to change some parameters. I want, for example, to have the, this batch size, this number of steps. Uh, I want to do like six iterations. I want to change the learning rates, and dropout, and many other th things. And you pass all these values here. Um, so. So this time, I'm not going to use uh, run alone. I'm going to also specify that I want to use this specific file. So another experiment is created. You um, can see that it's starting somewhere. And this experiment will have all the decoration that you created. Um, the thing is, like, once you start doing this one, two, three times, you, you're not going to be like every time going to your um, terminal and then starting another experiment. So the next phase is basically starting um, a group of experiments. But before doing that, for example, I want, uh, as I said, like here I did not provide a lot of um, a lot of metrics. Some experiments have more metrics that I that I provided, for example, but. This is just to have an overview about like the, the experiment. But what, what you want to do most probably is like um, if you go to all your experiments, I want to see, for example, the, the one that I ran before. But I want to run. Uh, I want to see how um, how those metrics that I reported with TensorBoard instead of uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, Polyaxon's uh, metric uh, metric step. So Polyaxon also make it really easy to start a TensorBoard. You don't need to uh, run it locally. Um, the, the way you start TensorBoard is basically you have different ways. So if you do TensorBoard start, what, what is going to happen is that um, basically Polyaxon creates um, some kind of like a job running in Kubernetes, and it creates a servers, uh, service around it. It's like a headless service. You cannot access it from outside of the platform. And then there is like some kind of like load balancer that knows how to redirect the users that are authorized to see that project to access to that uh, tensor board. So since we did not specify what kind of experiments I want to see in the TensorBoard, it just created a TensorBoard for the whole project. Um, there is a different way to start a TensorBoard. You can start it for a very specific experiment. If in this case it's very, uh, it's fine because we have only a couple of experiments with their evaluation. But imagine if you have, we're going to start like an experiment with 200 experiments running concurrently, and in that case it doesn't probably make sense to start all those. Uh, um, all those uh, to put all those uh, experiments in uh, one tensor board. So I'm um, gonna stop this one, and I'm gonna say, for example, I want to. I want to. Uh, so once it started, it you cannot access it anymore. Um, I'm gonna say, for example, I want to start the tensor board for this experiment and not for the whole project. 
So we just provide the same way I want, uh, like the experiments ID. And then you have, again, another job running somewhere. Uh, you can have more control over, uh, we will talk about that, how, f where the, the job should be running in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, most probably you don't want everyone to have access, for example, like for the TensorBoard, probably you don't need people to access GPU unless they, they need that G GPU. So when you don't say anything, Kubernetes just like run the, 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 the jobs somewhere where it's possible. Uh, in my case, I have a lot of nodes. Um, uh, so basically, I don't care, but for, if you have like some resources that you don't want to like waste them on some jobs that don't require those resources, for example, GPUs, you need to have like this kind of like annotations that we will see in, uh, uh, in the specification file. So now we started TensorBoard for one experiment. So the TensorBoard will have access only to that experiment. We don't show all the experiments, only one. Uh, that was a short experiment that we did, so it doesn't have like a lot of metrics. It has one evaluation, but yeah. So uh, now we can stop it again. We don't need to use it anymore. Um, now I'm gonna start um, um, experiment group. Um, so basically, I saw that I, I, I tried first like running the experiment, uh, the job directly, and then I changed some kind of parameters. It started another experiment. And probably I'm not also satisfied. I might do that manually a couple of times. And maybe I'm, I'm not super like um, uh, enthusiastic about like just trying a couple of values uh, manually. So what I'm gonna do is just I'm, I'm gonna run uh, with some kind of like hyperparameter search. And in this case, I'm gonna start um, a grid search. Um, can look at the, uh, so. So we have one group that is running. We can get that group also like the experiments inside that group. Ah, 28. That was the concurrency. So we have uh, a group of experiments that have 10 experiments, and I want to run five of those experiments in parallel. Uh, so basically, well, it's just the concurrency that we have here. Um, so we have a new section, different than the one that, that, that we saw. Uh, that we changed the, the kind of this, uh, this primitive. It's a group. And we say that I want to run, uh, okay, so this is a random search, not a grid search. I want to run 10 experiments in total. And I want to run five experiments in parallel. Uh, that's the concurrency. And I provide like uh, the search space that I want to search. So basically I want to go through the learning rates with the um, um, uh, linear space from 0 0.001 with five, five steps. I have two dropouts that, that I want to pick uh, with the, the same probability and two activation also that I want to pick with the same activation, uh, with the same uh, probability. Um, you have different kind of like, uh, we can check the, um, the sections. So we have different kind of like um, different kind of like distribution that you can use for uh, the hyperparameter uh, search. Uh, so if you are using a grid search, uh, you cannot use a continuous distribution because you cannot just you cannot have. Uh, so how grid search work is just using a Cartesian uh, product between all the, the values that you have, and you cannot say, for example, I want to pick uh, a uniform distribution because it's just one value. But you have to provide like it's 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 gonna be like random. So uh, you can use, for example, the values, the range. Uh, linear space, logarithmic space, or geometric space, and for anything else, there's a couple of um, there's a couple of um, um, algorithms that Polyxon provides. There is um, random search, uh, Bayesian optimization, and hyperbrand, and all these and all these algorithms can accept these kind of things. For example, if I have the values, uh, we said that we we use for activation two values, sigma, sigma and then. Uh, uh, and what is the other one? The ReLU. Uh, it was like probability 50-50. If I want to give, for example, ReLU like more uh, probability, I can use, for example, the p-value. So, for example, I would say ReLU uh, should be picked with 80% chance and the other one 20% chance. Um, you can use also like a uniform distribution. Um, there is like other kind of things. And in our case, we used, um, we used uh, random search. 
this is like the specification is very. This is, it's basically the, one of the simplest one. Um, the, by default, it uh, polygons on use grid search, and in this case, we use the random search. Uh, if you want to have access to uh, much uh, performance like algorithm, algorithms, you can use, for example, hyperband. Um, basically, uh, I can show like some experiment that I that I use hyperband with. So how it works is basically you have a resource that you want to optimize. You say, for example, how many iterations you want to use. There are some kind of parameters that you can play with. And you say, for example, the number of steps is the resource that I can play. Uh, f whenever you do a, a new suggestions, basically it uh, gets a new, uh, a new resource that you are going to like, use for creating these uh, suggestions. And in this case, it's like the number of steps. So how it works is like the first time when you start your experiments, you can start, for example, 200 experiments running uh, concurrently. And once you get like, the metrics back, you will start like op doing some optimizations, and then you say, for example, I want to start a half or like third or whatever. There is like a, a formula behind, and basically only some uh, only some experiments will be picked, only the, the the most performant ones. And you can also have control over if you want to do some kind of like a, uh, if you want to. Um, uh, for example, in this case, I'm using like the number of steps. So for the first time, it's going to be like two steps, and the next time, it's going to be, for example, 20 steps. So, if, uh, for example, one experiment uh, re uh, is basically performing really badly, you don't want to start it. So, you don't want to allocate more resources to, the, to that experiment. You just start with another experiment that has uh, most promising resources, and you have to provide like what you want to optimize for. So, in this case, I'm using loss. You can use foobar if you have a metric called foobar, and I say. I want to minimize this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this metric. If you are using, for example, accuracy, you will say I want to maximize this, this, uh, this uh, metric. So how it works is basically you create all these uh, this, uh, um, this, uh, first generation of experiments. Uh, it gets all the metrics back. And it is like all the most pr promising experiments, and then just allocate more resources to, this, uh, to those uh, experiments. And you can also like, say if you want to resume the experiment or just restart them from scratch. And there is Bison optimizations. Um, there's like a couple of things that you can use. There's like different acquisition functions and different kind of like uh, priors. Um, there will be also more. Uh, adding, for example, uh, uh, random search, uh, random um, um, forests, and so on and so forth. And the same way, you need to provide the metric that you want to optimize. You can also provide an early stopping for these groups. So that you say, for example, once one of these metrics reach like this value, for example, I want to minimize the loss. So any, any, uh, if any of the, the experiment that I run reach, for example, a value of 0.01 or less, I want to stop the whole thing. I don't want to keep like, wasting the resources of, the, of my cluster because I already like, hit the, 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 the value that I wanted to, to, to reach. And yeah, so this is how, how we construct this, uh, these algorithms. We can also like do another so we can check again the experiments if they are still running okay so it's already finished we, we didn't provide any kind of like um, any any kind of like uh, early stopping or anything it just went through all the, the random search uh, we can check also the values here on the dashboard so if you go to the experiment groups we'll find that there is one experiment and we can see the, the um, all those experiments we can check also like the values of those experiments the metrics and we can do this also uh, directly from here. So we, you see the, the experiment definition, but we can get also like the metrics of those experiments or the declaration if you want to compare the, the, the values between. So for example, uh, which experiment started with uh, what kind of like values. Um, if you, for example, see that one of the experiments is something that you like and you want to restart it, it's just doing this experiment. And then you provide the idea of that experiment that you want to restart, for example, this one. And then you start it. This will just basically create an experiment based on the other experiment. It basically reuses the same kind of like values. Uh, and by the same values, I mean like the same kind of configuration here. Um, if there is like some kind of node that you want to uh, use that experiment on, it will be like started on the same experiment. It will use the same Docker image and many other like things that the, the platform tracks. Um, so now we saw. Uh, so yeah, and the, third, the the last thing that I want to say about also like TensorBot is that you can also start a TensorBot for a group. For example, if you want to compare the values, so we saw that we can start a, a TensorBot for projects for an experiment. We can also do as, do the same thing for for the group. Uh, 
basically in this case it will only like among all the, the experiments in the project it will only show the experiments inside this very specific group. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, what do you mean by the, the metrics, for okay so, yeah it could be any kind of like um, key value metric uh, so basically you just provide the name of the metric for, yeah. as I said like you can provide foo ah uh, yeah so uh, I can show for example sorry <coughs> yes okay uh, so how do we report metrics to the platform so it's called mol so in this case I'm running, uh, running a file call, called mol and at the very end of the experiment, I'm just doing send metrics. The send metrics is coming from uh, a helper that um, that's the platform provides. So this is why in in my um, in my polyaxon files, I always do this pip install here because I want to use the. So basically, I'm just saying that I want in my build to install also like the helper that the, the platform provides so that I can use a couple of things. So it's not only using the, this to send metrics, it also like does a lot of things. And for example, uh, we can go to another project uh, that has um, code that can run uh, that can run distributed the um, distributed so in this case, for example, um, I'm using uh, a distributed uh, experiment with one worker and one, one uh, parameter server. And in order to run this, uh, because in the end, what does Polyaxon? It just create the, the topology of all these kind of like um, uh, pods and creates, for example, in the case of po uh, TensorFlow, uh, it creates a headless service so that they can, uh, they can communicate through the gRPC uh, server uh, that, that they, they create. And in order to know where each one of these pods is running, um, you need to know the TF config and all these kind of like things. And that's why you use, I mean, you can use uh, uh, any kind of like other code for, because in the end, we just like export some kind of uh, environment variable. But to keep things really easy, you can install this helper and then you get, for example, where should I put my outputs? And basically, it's just here. Otherwise, you can just like go directly and then get it from the environment variable. Um, in the case of, uh, for example, the, the, if I want to get the cluster definition, how, for example, in this case, I have like two workers, one master and one PS. So le let's start, for example, this uh, distributed experiment. So if I do this, okay. I'll jump on. Back up it. Okay, it's still building. Uh, I did not hit yet uh, Kubernetes to start the, the jobs, but. Um, um, once it starts creating the jobs for that experiment, we'll see that it's, it's something that, um, yeah, so it's now running. If we do the jobs, see that it's created like a, a master worker can get also like the logs automatically. So if you are doing, for example, this use of the learning at this point, you will probably like um, be um, getting the logs from each server uh, with the, some kind of like SSH or, or some kind of other uh, method. Uh, in the case of Polyaxon, it just aggregates all your, all your logs in one output. So once we hit like one of the PS or the worker, it will also show with a different color. So in this case, like here's the worker. And this is like coming like out of the box. Um, it could be like very easy to, to do like a distributed learning with three workers. But imagine, for example, I just uh, I keep this like working in the background and I change the Polyaxon this, uh, this distributed file and say I want to use now two workers. Um, if you do that manually, I don't know if you can even do it manually, like you will go to each machine and then start exporting some, run, some values on like what port is like the other machine is running and stuff. So in this case, it's going to be like basically the same. I'm just saying I want to run with this distributed 
uh, this is distributed uh, experiments. And same way, if I do the jobs for this one, for four zero, hopefully it's already running. So it's created five, two, uh, uh, one master, two worker, and two PS. And I can also like get the logs for this one. It also like brings all the logs. Of obviously, if you are running a distributed experiment with, I don't know, twenty or like forty workers, you will not uh, get anything um, visually pleasant from seeing all these logs coming from all these uh, uh, these values. Uh, so what you can do is, for example, you can say. Well, I don't want to get all these logs. I want to get only the logs, for example, from this job. And this will only stream the logs for that job. And you don't need, I mean, if, even if you are using Kubernetes at this moment and you are doing this kind of like distributed learning, what you will do is like kubectl logs get that pod. And you need to know the pod and it probably has a hash and all these kind of things. In this case, you can always get the experiments and all the, the values related to that experiment easily. Um, you can also get all these kind of like things. Um, so it's a different project. You can get the same kind of like information also from the from the dashboard. Uh, it's a cipher in this case, and this is our last experiments. And you can see that it's running like four. Um, you can have like more. Uh, the thing is like there's m many more other information that the platform tracks. Um, it did not make it surf uh, make it yet to the dashboard and the CLI, but it's gonna in the future. So yeah, so that's um, that's basically how the um, exper experiment experimentation works. And once you start like doing a lot of, um, so uh, if I go back again to the other like um, running the groups, and I decide, for example, to run hyperband with like 200 experiments. So let's check the hyperband example. Uh, no, that's. Wrong projects. So, uh, say I want to run, for example, Hyperband. I want to run 200 experiments in concurrently, and I have a couple of things that I want to try. Um, and if you do that a couple of times, it will be really hard to navigate all the. Uh, uh, I mean, imagine if you are also like doing that manually, like all this kind of uh, experiments. I'm, uh, Yeah. How are you matching the hyperparameters uh, values in your YAML file with the ones in the? Uh, so, um, so how how do we get like from this file with all these like just uh, distributions and values into like experiments where you say, for example, um, this experiment runs with this with this specific value. So how it works is like this uh, on the on the command line interface. There is like a um, specification validator that just check that the specification specification is correct. It sends this to the um, to the um, to the server. And if we go to the tutorial project, it will start. Um, so if we go to the experiments groups, we have a new experiments group. It's called it's Hyperband. You just created 243 experiments. Um, and it's running 200. We can check them here. And how it works is basically it also like parses that, that specification. And obviously, if you have here, if you have, for example, a uniform value, a uniform distribution for learning rate, it's basically just going to sample that value for each experiment. It's going to just pick, for example, here, it's going to pick a value with 50% chance either 0 0.25 or 0 0.3, and for ReLU 0 0.1, and for Sigma 0 0.8. So whatever you specify in the specification, it's just going to, the, there's a parser behind, and then it's just going to basically use, uh, basically behind the scene, just NumPy for like sampling all these values, creating an experiment, and expo uh, basically telling like how to run the experiment with the specific values. Obviously, all these uh, these uh, parameters here, they need to to match somehow your code. If you are just generating uh, a parameter, say foobar, for example, with I don't know uh, log uh, uniform distribution, or whatever. I mean, it just you are just gonna create an experiment with that foobar, but that foobar is not used anywhere. So right now we have a lot of experiments running and, and okay, so maybe I don't want to see everything. I just want to see, for example, the, and that's the, the next thing that I want to show is like the search or like the filters. Um, so, see that, okay. so 
once you hit like uh, a number of experiments in your cluster, uh, yesterday I was a bit, when I, start, when I provisioned this cluster, I thought, yeah, I, may, I, may, I didn't know about the internet and everything, and I started like, a huge cluster. I was running 3,000 experiments in parallel <laughs> just to test, test how, um, how, the, how the, uh, the platform can handle a lot of traffic and everything. And basically, I managed to run 13,000 experiments in less than two hours. And basically, searching what experiments failed and what experiments um, succeeded is, is going to be like hard if you are doing this manually. So the platform provides uh, a way, for example, I can go to it was with kickstarts. Um, so if I want to check only the experiment that failed during the whole thing, I can use the statuses, status uh, thing. And then only two experiments fell during, like, so as we said, like, there is 13,000, I don't know if you see, so there's like 13,000 experiments that was running uh, yesterday, and only two, like, failed. Um, I can also, like, say I want to get the fail, okay, in this case it's, it's not going to work, but, like, um, for the other experiments, um, it was, no, it was not this one, it was this. I might be interested in uh, experiments that are uh, either have created or running, or not running, like started, for example. Okay, none? Uh, okay, I can do also like the negative of this. Just return anything that, that doesn't belong to this. Uh, um, to, to that two status. Of, obviously, you can also the thing is you can also check um, if we uh, if we do, for example, I want to check anything that belongs to this build uh, number thirty nine, uh, number fifty, for example, or number uh, I don't know how many builds this experiment has. For example, I want to get all all the experiments that have built forty five. So you know exactly like all the experiments that run with a specific, for example, Docker container or, or Git commit. Yes? Uh, maybe a quite nice question, but when you have an experiment that you run, can you clone that, change one thing, and run it again? Yeah, that's exactly what I did. Uh, OK, so restarting the experiments, I can actually show. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to go to the documentation, because it's actually better to show uh, that there. Um, So there's different ways to restart an experiment. Um, there is like just, uh, you need first if you want, so if you want to just restart the experiment and you don't care about the previous results, you just do restart. Um, you can also resume. So basically you stop an experiment and you decide in the future that, okay, I'm gonna stop it right now, but I want to provide like more GPUs for this experiment. You stop it and then you just say, I want to resume. Uh, if you want to restart and have a different configuration, for example, you want to override the learning rate, you just provide an overriding file. You so basically, how does uh, overriding works? Um, I'm not sure if I have any. OK, so this one is. So here, I um, actually uh, can use any other file, but I'm saying that I want to use the file, for example, like one file that has uh, a group or an experiment, I want to override the builds. It's like Docker Compose, basically. You can just say, for example, polyaxon run or like restart, and then you provide the first file, and then the second file, and then it will just, mer uh, so basically latest, so it will just like uh, merge them by taking the, the last one and then overriding the first one. And that's the same also like for restarting, you can just say, I want to restart but this, with, this, uh, with this file. And you say, for example, I'm gonna override, for example, two values, like the learning rate and the, uh, the, uh, the activation, for example, for some specific layer somewhere. And it should also like work. No, the, no, all the experiments, uh, so do you, when you start an experiment or resume an experiment, do you lose the previous experiment? No, you don't lose any experiments because all the experiments are immutable. Whenever you run an experiment, it has an ID, it has some kind of uh, path in uh, one of the volumes for the logs, one path for the outputs, and has like what kind of build it used and pretty much uh, git commit and any other thing. When you restart, you can say, for example, I want to restart but the, with the latest code. 
In that case, it will basically use the same configuration, and it, cre it will create a new, uh, a new immutable uh, experiment again with the same kind of conf configuration. It will only overwrite, for example, the code, or like for that case, like the learning rate, for example. But it's completely two, two different experiments, and you can compare them, and you can also check all the logs and everything. Everything is immutable, basically. Uh, I mean, the, you have uh, delete access. You can delete like experiments from the, the, the platform, but it's not advisable because you can also, for example, if you are using a job and you want to, um, you can, so the thing is like you can give uh, to experiments or like experiment groups. For example, this number 39, you can give it like a name. I mean, you can give it a name, description, and pretty much a lot of things. For example, you just say description and say, for example, that was a bad group <laughs> and like tag it with some, well, I don't know, pi data, for example and give it like a name that's unique name is like only for that thing and basically all this kind of information helps you for example for the search when you go back you can use all these kind of tags and stuff too so if you have 13,000 experiments it's really hard to paginate through them so you need to have like as much organization as possible so that you can always get back to the same kind of like group and all these kind of things and yeah the name I say I don't know group one whatever Uh, my, yeah, uh, one moment, please. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's not minus B, also, it's minus G. So minus group. Yeah, you can. Okay. Okay, and it's tag, it's not tag. Yeah, you get it, so. <laughs> So there's a lot of things that you need to learn with this, but like it's pretty much trying to get to like what what, what you use what are you using in other like platforms like GitHub or whatever. So it's kind of like close. Uh, right now, the only way to interact with the API is through the CLI or through the REST API. But hopefully, in the future, we'll have some time to also like upgrade the the dashboard so we can also do all these kind of things uh, from here. So if we go here, we will find that okay. So we have now a description and we have a, a tag here, and you can use that, for example, although we don't have a lot of tags, we can they say, for example, tags and then by data, and it will get us, but imagine if you have like more, then it, it will have like much more impact. Um, so going back to um, the specification, you have, as I said, like there's a couple of like primitives that you can use, job, uh, every, every uh, one of these specifications have a couple of like sections that you can use. As we said, for example, for the experiments, it has like declaration environments. I will talk briefly about the environments. You can have like much more control uh, with these environments uh, uh, in terms of like the pod that you're running, if you want GPU, if you want to run it somewhere in the cluster, very specific. Um, uh, and also like if you want to have some kind of like out outputs coming from other like jobs and stuff. Um, in the group section you have the uh, hyperparameter tuning uh, uh, section that we that we saw uh, which has pretty much the seed, the, the matrix, the, the space that we want to traverse and also like what kind of like algorithm that we want to use. Um, so going to for example the environments. You can have like a, a lot of control over what, how much CPU, memory, and GPU that you want to use for an experiment. If you provide any of these values and you start the experiments, it will restart with the very same kind of like. So that's going back to technical depth. For example, if you are running an experiment and you reach some results, and the next time you're restarting the experiment and probably it's using GPU and you are not reaching the same thing, if you are really caring about like this kind of like compliance, you can have this kind of like resource section, and then you provide exactly how much resource uh, you want to run this experiment with. This is also like could be useful for example if you have a team and for example two guys are like for example interns and you don't want to provide the interns with the GPU. You just say for example you cannot access the GPU. Um, you can have also, so the thing is um, once you start like hitting some kind of like uh, scalability um, uh, levels you don't you cannot use only one volume for the data, and most probably you have data sc scattered in different kind of volumes. You can have also like access to different volumes for 
each uh, uh, experiment. You can just say, for example, I want to use volume one, two, three, and the DevOps basically just provide you with the names, but he knows how to mount this. One of, one of these volumes is NFS, the other one is cluster FS, and basically he knows some, some of them are coming from the, the hosts node, for example, and basically the, the platform will know how to mount all these kind of like volumes in your pod and, have, and, give, and give you access directly to all this with the path and everything. Uh, node selector. So imagine you have, for example, um, uh, let's just say for in this case I have 50 nodes uh, because I was thinking I'm going to be running 3,000 experiments in parallel. So, um, and for, for instance, I want one team to be only like targeting like three, three nodes. I can always say, for example, you can have access to the GPU, as we said, with the resources. But imagine if you have like a Tesla ATM one and the other, the other one is like 100 whatever reference, and you want to use that specific GPU, that latest one. You don't want to say, for example, to Kubernetes, I want to use any GPU, I want to use that GPU, you can reference which node you want to use. And basically, Polygon will redirect and schedule this experiment on, the, uh, on that very specific um, uh, node. You can have, um, so as I said, like at the beginning, uh, the, the platform can run anything that can be run in uh, Docker. So basically any kind of code, but we have very uh, we have some kind of like specifications for some some uh, uh, some uh, platforms, namely for TensorFlow, for PyTorch, MXNet, and Horvolt. And the reason why is that these platforms provide this distributed learning. And as we uh, just said, like for example, if you want to run an experiment with like five workers, five PS, whatever it's going to be really hard to do that manually. And the reason also is that, for example, you want the workers to work with the GPU and the PS to have only CPU, for example, because they don't do much work. And you can have this kind of like things also with the resources for each one of these workers running your experiment, distributed experiments. Um, the same thing with the, the PyTorch and MXNet, you have a lot of control over the, the resources, the, the, the nodes where you want to, to use them, and yeah. Um, what else? Um, yeah, uh, last thing is like most of you will be probably using uh, a notebook before even hitting like this kind of like code that runs. So I have already like uh, running a notebook is also like as easy, just like Polyaxon notebook, and you can also have as much control in terms of like where you want to run the notebook, how much resources, and many other things. So I have already like for example a project that I have a notebook with this one. Reviews and once you start like a notebook, it's also creating uh, a pod for that notebook. It creates a headless um, server and gives you access to the the notebook. The notebook cannot cannot be accessed, for example, from an an uh, a not logged in user and also or, or even a logged in user but doesn't have like the, the right to access to that to that uh, notebook. And yeah, you can run the same thing as you did, for example, like the tutorials that you saw this morning, for example, you can run them also. Uh, if you have, for example, a couple of like users in your uh, organization and you have like GPUs and you don't, they have like very old, for example, computers, you can, they can run pretty much anything and then you want to give them like access to that GPU. Um, you don't require them to be like DevOps also to start all these experiments and you can basically also like, yeah, run things the same way you run. This is running somewhere in some cloud pl platform. Uh, and you don't, you, you just gave, gave them like this kind of like abstraction. They don't need to access to the cluster. They don't need to, to SSH to any machine. You, did, you just provide them with like basically uh, Polyags or Notebook start and then it starts the, the same thing. Um, once you are done with the notebook, you, uh, the same way, just say stop. Uh, if you want to make a commit after doing something with the notebook, you just do dash dash. Uh, so let's see the, the help for, for that. Help. Notebooks are by default like running on a project level because it doesn't make sense to run them like in experimental groups because you have code in one project. It's like the same way you would do with GitHub. You have your, your code and then you just access it in some kind of like notebook. Um, you can start stop, get the URL if you forgot, and okay, that's missing, but it should be, there should be also like minus minus for uh, commits after finishing the, the work if you want to commit that, that work af afterwards. Um, well, what else um, we can talk about um, is so we, we saw that we can use um, um, we saw the, the filtering how we can uh, run project jobs uh, jobs could be like as we said like 
pre uh, pre uh, experiments or post experiments or just like do some kind of like operation um, you have a, you have different kind of like users in the platform um, so you can have different also roles. Anyone can, for example, you can uh, also uh, provide ways to log into the platform through GitLab, uh, GitHub, and uh, Bitbucket. Um, and the users need, need to be activated by one of the admins. So basically, if I create a new user, I just need to, for example, activate that user or, or delete it. I can also give the users um, super, super user role, basically to be also like admin of the platform. Um, we saw the, um, the clients. You can use also like the, the platform uh, in a restful way. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much going through like the most of the, the the features. Probably I forgot something, but there's a lot of things that could be done. Uh, do you have any kind of questions uh, while I'm? Could you briefly outline the advantages of using PolyXM? Yeah, so as I said, if you are just doing a tutorial in PyData and you are going to delete that code afterwards, you don't need that. Um, if you are using, for example, if you want to have like a production model that you want to deploy somewhere, and you know that you're not going to hit that uh, metric that you are trying to get to after one or three experiments, like uh, as we said, we just started like a huge experiment group, then you need somehow some organization because, as I said, you can for, forget like, for, forgot like a, what kind of like code you use, what kind of parameters you use, what kind of like. I mean, imagine if you are only having this problem with stainless of the model uh, every week. Basically, the model decreases in terms of like metrics or like some kind of performance, and you want to retrigger the the um, the, the, the 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 retraining. Uh, if you don't know exactly, if you are not really organizing in terms of your work, you might forget something, and this something could be like really fatal in terms of like reproducing that, that experiment or just like running that experiment. And if you leave, yeah, your 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 colleagues are at the mercy of your uh, um, your documentation. Basically, if they can do anything with the, with, with your code. So that's where you can use the platform, basically having some kind of organization for your workflow. OK. Hey, uh, you said uh, experiments are kind of like commits. Is there kind of a, a diff you can make, like within Git, where you can uh, check the diff of your uh, source code? Um, so the, the right now what you can, experiments? Yeah. Uh, right now what you can do is basically, uh, as I said, like you can sh show the, the parameters used, um, but there is no, there is no like um, showing like the, co uh, you can see the commits. Uh, you can also like download the internal, the internal um, code. So <coughs> I do help here. Um, here we have download. Uh, the same was uh, uh, upload, and you can see all the, the commits. Uh, obviously, for each one of the experiments, this is something that needs to needs a lot of work. Um, so, for example, this one used th this build, and the build like has a hash. Uh, obviously, you will you will do it somehow manually for now, but there is no kind of like page where you are showing, for example, what kind of like code changes. Change, sorry. <laughs> What about data? Um, is data worth yeah. somehow? Or? So for data, as I said, if you are running a job, um, each job will have like an output. Um, uh, so we can do so. so. basically, you will have like an output where you are do. Once you get, as I said, like there is like two kind of volumes. Let me show the the um, the help charts. So persistence. We have a couple of things that we need to persist. Like there's the logs, there's the repos, there's the the uploads, the data, and the outputs. So data is something that, of course, you can mount it as a read-write, and all the users will have read-write, and then they can delete anything. Or you can say, for example, the data is only ac accessible in read mode. And every job, every experiment has an output, which is in a different kind of volumes. And if you, for example, run in a job that does some kind of uh, processing of the data, data augmentation, whatever, or like even download is something, you're just going to put it in the outputs. And you ref reference that job or that experiment for the next experiment you are doing, for example, um, 
uh, you are using the, the output to keep, for example, doing like some kind of uh, resuming the the, the, um, the training. You just access to the output and not the the, the data. The, you, you don't change the data, so you can have this control if you provide read mode only for the data. And every job basically does something. It just exports it to the outputs, and you have access to the outputs for whatever other jobs needs that output. So that the data stays basically also immutable. And obviously, since you are not deleting anything from the platform, all the jobs will have their output somewhere and they are organized. You can always also, um, so basically, if you have a job, you can do job output uh, minus G and then the ID, for example, and it will download the outputs if you want. Of course, if it's not big, otherwise, you will be waiting. Um, otherwise, you can also mount, uh, you can also like um, uh, install uh, Minio to have an S3 access to all your volume, but there's some, something that you need also to talk with your uh, DevOps. For experiments, is the same thing. If you do experiments, minus XP ID outputs, it will get the outputs. For, for example, if it's a, a TensorFlow and has some kind of like uh, artifacts or whatever, some kind of like uh, model that you want to download is the same way. But it's always uh, organized in all the, the volumes that you provide for the platform. And they, they, I mean, no other job has the, the right to touch the, those uh, experiments. If you follow, basically, there, there's some organization that you need also to follow. As I said, if you provide read-write to your users and they want to do whatever, I mean, in the end, they, they will do whatever they want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, how do you handle scaling? So, uh, I mean, uh, if you run uh, 13,000 experiments, you don't want to have idle a couple of hundred instances around and cost you a lot of money. Or if you otherwise only run an experiment every two to three days, you don't want your GPU instance to always run. You want it actually to be turned off and then only turned on. Yeah, I mean, as I said, there's two ways to turn off the experiments. Um, you can wait for them to finish. And if you're running that manually, uh, Kubernetes will not do that for you or any other platform. It will not just like kill because they don't know what is what, it, what does it mean to finish uh, uh, and kill, for example, an experiment. We have, for example, for distributed learning right now, there is like one policy for ter termination. If the master finishes, basically, Polyak don't send the signal to all the workers to 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 stop uh, um, doing uh, the job. If you are running an experiment group, for example, as you said, and you have early stopping, once, as I said, like, once you hit that metric that you want, well, the, the platform will send a signal to all experiments running to stop uh, and uh, basically uh, release the resources that they are using at, at that moment. Um, if you did not reach the, the metric that you want, well, basically the algorithm will keep searching. That's why basically you started the, 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 the group, so that you search through a large um, uh, space search. So that's the only two things that you can do. If you're running an experiment that you want to run it for three days, then you are responsible for probably for your code. I mean, uh, if, yeah, I mean, like, for example, if you, uh, if you see many of the, the, the latest deep learning like models, they, they require two weeks, for example, of training. You cannot just like say after three days you need to stop experiments. Some experiments need to run for, for three days or for two weeks. Hi. Uh, from my understanding, uh, if you run a uh, Jupyter Notebook, uh, you don't have experiments, right? You just have a project. Uh, yeah, so, no, you can run experiments. Uh, so you can have, for example, I mean, let's do it for one of the projects. We can, you can start a, a notebook. Uh, for example, I can start a notebook for, for this project. But I can also start an experiment. Uh, Okay, I don't know, a field, ah, yeah, I need a file. I probably don't have file for this project. Uh, so you need a, a, the file, so here, for example, I can start, here I have, uh, I have a polyaxon notebook file, so I can just do polyaxon run minus f, um, sorry, notebook start minus f polyaxon notebook. This will start a notebook in your project, and you can still, do run minus f polyaxon, for example, and we'll start Bayesian optimization, for example, and it should work. What you cannot do is upload code and make git commits because you are already acting on the on the the code at that moment. So, for example, if I if I try to upload, it will not allow me to do that because the projects because when you have like a notebook, you are probably doing also like some tweaking in the code and you cannot just make a comment over something that is already changing. 
Uh, okay, but if you if you do that uh, that thing that you just said, that uh, uploading a notebook and then doing some changes on your notebook, you can commit the changes. Uh, in the notebook or locally? No, uh, I mean in the platform. Because no, I mean, as I said, like if when I start running this uh, experiment group, it will just run it with the whatever commit I provided or the latest commit that the platform has. But you cannot change the, the, the code anymore until you stop the, the notebook because uh, it's just like an overhead of like doing all this kind of like who should the commit first and all this kind of like uh, no, no, I'm conflict. talking about when you do Polygon notebook or run notebook. Yeah, notebook start. Yeah, notebook starts. Yeah, you can also have, uh, you can upload the code with the, you can do also notebook starts minus U, and it will upload before starting the notebook. Yeah, but then you start the notebook, you do some You start it with, yeah. You do some changes. Ah, you, locally. Yes. Um, why would you do that locally no, no. if you have a notebook also no, accessing not the same code? Not locally, sorry. In the notebook. Okay. Uh, then w w can you commit the changes? Yeah, so when you, when you want to, when you finish doing whatever you are doing with the notebook, you can say stop. Or you can say stop minus minus commit, which means that I want to stop the notebook and I want to keep the latest changes that I made when I was working with the notebook. And it will make a commit with your latest changes. And then you can revert uh, uh, the uh, commit back? Uh, you, ha you, ca you have to synchronize then. Oh, okay. So, okay. yeah, I mean, you need to, uh, to communicate with because the, the code is uh, on the Git, uh, on the, the server, not locally. Okay, thank you. If there is no more questions, I uh, would probably like to talk a bit about uh, uh, the near-term uh, roadmap of the before like finishing. Um, so, yeah. So, um, basically, right now, uh, what I was like trying is like to have some kind of uh, workflow where you can run experiments, have as much automation as possible in terms of like what to run, when, how, have reproducibility. And uh, the future is like, as I said, like for example, stainless of the model, or for example, if you have some kind of like triggers, uh, you have for example a new bucket in S3, and you want to run your experiment with the latest code from that S3. Uh, right now, what you can do is basically use some Airflow Luigi. And there was like a workshop with Luigi where you are basically talking with the API. But I think it's also not ideal because you will lose this kind of like uh, compliance uh, where you are com if something is coming from outside we we don't have like much control over the, the outside so basically polyaxon will be providing a very simple uh, abstraction for uh, pipelines and operation triggers that for example you say i want to run or retrain this very sp uh, experiments wh whenever for example my model is uh, starts uh, the, the performance of my model start decreasing or for example if there is like new code uh, new uh, new data for, uh, um, for example, in the database or like in some kind of like bucket somewhere in S3 or or other um, uh, other uh, platforms. Um, there's also like things that I'm thinking about, like webhooks. For example, if you you can use Git as the main source for Git, for example, you push the, co the code to Git, and there's a webhook that triggers, for example, the experiment to start. Um, that's the more or less the short term, and have like better use cases for the, the dashboard. Then now. Yeah. Then let's thank this speaker. And, uh